This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. Paul's Case, A Study in Temperament, by Willa Cather. Read for LibriVox by Beth Peet at Reading, UK. It was Paul's afternoon to appear before the faculty of the Pittsburgh High School to account for his various misdemeanors. He had been suspended a week ago, and his father had called at the principal's office and confessed his perplexity about his son. Paul entered the faculty room, suave and smiling. His clothes were a trifle outgrown, and the tan velvet on the collar of his open overcoat was frayed and worn. But for all that, there was something of the dandy about him, and he wore an opal pin in his neatly knotted black foreign hand and a red carnation in his buttonhole. This latter adornment the faculty somehow felt was not properly significant of the contrite spirit befitting a boy under the ban of suspension. Paul was tall for his age and very thin, with high, cramped shoulders and a narrow chest. His eyes were remarkable for a certain hysterical brilliancy, and he continually used them in a conscious, theatrical sort of way, particularly offensive in a boy. The pupils were abnormally large, as though he were addicted to belladonna, but there was a glassy glitter about them that the drug does not produce. When questioned by the principal as to why he was there, Paul stated politely enough that he wanted to come back to school. This was a lie, but Paul was quite accustomed to lying, found it, indeed, indispensable for overcoming friction. His teachers were asked to state their respective charges against him, which they did with such a rancor and aggrievedness as evinced that this was not a usual case. Disorder and impertinence were among the offenses named, yet each of his instructors felt that it was scarcely possible to put into words the real cause of the trouble, which lay in a sort of hysterically defiant manner of the boys, in the contempt which they all knew he felt for them, and which he seemingly made not the least effort to conceal. Once, when he had been making a synopsis of a paragraph at the blackboard, his English teacher had stepped to his side and attempted to guide his hand. Paul had started back with a shudder and thrust his hands violently behind him. The astonished woman could scarcely have been more hurt and embarrassed had he struck her. The insult was so involuntary and definitely personal as to be unforgettable in one way, and another he had made all his teachers, men and women alike, conscious of the same feeling of physical aversion. In one class he habitually sat with his hand shading his eyes, in another he always looked out of the window during the recitation, in another he made a running commentary on the lecture with humorous intention. His teachers felt this afternoon that his whole attitude was symbolized by his shrug and his flippantly red carnation flower, and they fell upon him without mercy, his English teacher leading the pack. He stood through it smiling, his pale lips parted over his white teeth. His lips were continually twitching, and he had a habit of raising his eyebrows that was contemptuous and irritating to the last degree. Older boys than Paul had broken down and shed tears under that baptism of fire, but his set smile did not once desert him, and his only sign of discomfort was the nervous trembling of the fingers that toyed with the buttons of his overcoat, and an occasional jerking of the other hand that held his hat. Paul was always smiling, always glancing about him, seeming to feel that people might be watching him and trying to detect something. This conscious expression, since it was as far as possible from bo boyish mirthfulness, was usually attributed to insolence or smartness. As the Inquisition proceeded, one of his instructors repeated an impertinent remark of the boys, and the principal asked him whether he thought that a courteous speech to have made a woman. Paul shrugged his shoulders slightly and his eyebrows twitched. "'I don't know,' he replied. "'I didn't mean to be polite or impolite, either. I guess it's the sort of way I have of saying things, regardless.' The principal, who was a sympathetic man, asked him whether he didn't think that a way it would be well to get rid of. Paul grinned and said he guessed so. When he was told that he could go, he bowed gracefully and went out. His bow was but a repetition of the scandalous red carnation. His teachers were in despair, and his drawing-master voiced the feeling of all of them when he declared there was something about the boy which none of them understood. He added, "'I don't really believe that smile of his comes altogether from insolence. There's something sort of haunted about it. The boy is not strong, for one thing. I happen to know that he was born in Colorado, only a few months before his mother died out there of a long illness. There's something wrong about the fellow.' The drawing-master had come to realize that, in looking at Paul, one saw only his white teeth in the forced animation of his eyes. One warm afternoon the boy had gone to sleep at his drawing-board, and his master had noted with amazement what a white, blue-veined face it was, drawn and wrinkled like an old man's about the eyes, the lips twitching even in his sleep, 
and stiff with the nervous tension that drew them back from his teeth. His teachers left the building dissatisfied and unhappy, humiliated to have felt so vindictive toward a mere boy, to have uttered this feeling in cutting terms, and to have set each other on, as it were, in the gruesome game of intemperate reproach. Some of them remembered having seen a miserable street cat set at bay by a ring of tormentors. As for Paul, he ran down the hill whistling the soldier's chorus from Faust, looking wildly behind him now and then to see whether some of his teachers were not there to writhe under his light-heartedness. As it was now late in the afternoon, and Paul was on duty that evening as usher at Carnegie Hall, he decided he would not go home to supper. When he reached the concert hall, the doors were not yet open, and as it was chilly outside, he decided to go up into the picture gallery, always deserted at this hour, where there were some of Raffaele's gay studies at Paris streets, and an airy blue Venetian scene or two that always exhilarated him. He was delighted to find no one in the gallery but the old guard, who sat in one corner, a newspaper on his knee, a black patch over one eye, and the other closed. Paul possessed himself of the piece and walked confidently up and down, whistling under his breath. After a while he sat down before Blue Rico and lost himself. When he bethought him to look at his watch, it was after seven o'clock, and he rose with a start and ran downstairs, making a face at Augustus, peering out from the cast-room, and an evil gesture at the Venus de Milo as he passed her on the stairway. When Paul reached the usher's dressing-room, half a dozen boys were there already, and he began excitedly to tumble into his uniform. It was one of the few that had all approached fitting, and Paul thought it was very becoming, though he knew that the tight, straight coat ex accentuated his narrow chest, about which he was exceedingly sensitive. He was always considerably excited while he dressed, twanging over all the tuning of the strings and the preliminary flourishes of the horns in the music-room, but to-night he seemed quite beside himself and he teased and plagued the boys, until, telling that he was crazy, they put him down on the floor and sat on him. Somewhat calmed by his suppression, Paul dashed out to the front of the house to seat the early comers. He was a model usher. Gracious and smiling, he ran up and down the aisles. Nothing was too much trouble for him. He carried messages and brought programs as though it was his greatest pleasure in life, and all the people in his section thought him a charming boy, feeling that he remembered and admired them. As the house filled, he grew more and more vivacious and animated, and the colour came to his cheeks and lips. It was very much as though this were a great reception and Paul was the host. Just as the musicians came out to take their places, his English teacher arrived with checks for the seats which a prominent manufacturer had taken for the season. She betrayed some embarrassment when she handed Paul the tickets, and a hauteur which subsequently made her feel very foolish. Paul was startled for a moment, and had the feeling of wanting to put her out. What business had she here among all these fine people in gay colours? He looked her over and decided that she was not appropriately dressed, and must be a fool to sit downstairs in such togs. The tickets had probably been sent her out of kindness, he reflected, as he put down a seat for her, and she had about as much right to sit there as he had. When the symphony began, Paul sank into one of the rear seats with a long sigh of relief, and lost himself as he had done before the Rico. It was not that symphonies, as such, meant anything in particular to Paul, but the first sigh of the instrument seemed to free some hilarious and potent spirit within him, something that struggled there like the genie in the bottle found by the Arab fisherman. He felt a sudden zest of life, the lights danced before his eyes, and the concert hall blazed into unimaginable splendour. When the soprano soloist came on, Paul forgot even the nastiness of his teacher's being there, and gave himself up to the particular stimulus such personages always had for him. The soloist chanced to be a German woman, by no means in her first youth, and the mother of many children. But she wore an elaborate gown and a tiara, and above all she had that indefinable air of achievement, that world shine upon her, which, in Paul's eyes, made her a veritable queen of romance. After a concert was over, Paul always felt irritable and wretched until he got to sleep, and tonight he was even more than usually restless. He had the feeling of not being able to let down, of its being impossible to give up this delicious excitement which was the only thing that could be called living at all. During the last number he withdrew, and after hastily changing his clothes in the dressing-room, slipped out to the side door where the soprano's carriage stood. Here he began pacing rapidly up and down the walk, waiting to see her come out. Over yonder, the Shenley, in its vacant stretch, loomed big and square through the fine rain, the windows of its twelve stories glowing like those of a lighted cardboard house under a Christmas tree. All the actors and singers of the better class stayed there when they were in the city, and a number of the big manufacturers of the place lived there in the winter. Paul had often hung about the hotel, watching the people go in and out, longing to enter and leave schoolmasters and dull care behind him forever. At last the singer came out, accompanied by the conductor, 
who helped her into her carriage and closed the door with a cordial of Fiedersheim, which set Paul to wondering whether she was not an old sweetheart of his. Paul followed the carriage over to the hotel, walking so rapidly as to not be far from the entrance when the singer alighted, and disappeared behind the swinging glass doors that were opened by a negro in a tall hat and a long coat. In the moment that the door was ajar, it seemed to Paul that he, too, entered. He seemed to feel himself go after her up the steps, into the warm, lighted building, into an exotic, tropical world of shiny, glistening surfaces and basking ease. He reflected upon the mysterious dishes that were brought into the dining-room, the green bottles and buckets of ice, as he had seen them in the supper-party pictures in the Sunday World Supplement. A quick gust of wind brought the rain down with sudden vehemence, and Paul was startled to find that he was still outside in the slush of the gravel driveway, that his boots were letting in the water, and his scanty overcoat was clinging wet about him, that the lights in front of the concert hall were out, and that the rain was driving in sheets between him and the orange glow of the windows above him. There it was, what he wanted, tangibly before him, like the fairy world of a Christmas pantomime. But mocking spirits stood guard at the doors, and as the rain beat in his face, Paul wondered whether he were destined always to shiver in the black night outside, looking up at it. He turned and walked reluctantly towards the car tracks. The end had to come some time, his father in his night clothes at the top of the stairs, explanations that did not explain, hastily improvised fictions that were forever tripping him up his upstairs room with its horrible yellow wallpaper, the creaking bureau with a greasy plush collar-box, and over his painted wooden bed the pictures of George Washington and John Calvin, and the framed motto, Feed My Lambs, which had been worked and red worsted by his mother. Half an hour later, Paul alighted from his car and went slowly down one of the side streets off the main thoroughfare. It was a highly respectable street, where all the houses were exactly alike, and where businessmen of moderate means begot and reared large families of children, all of whom went to Sabbath school and learned the shorter catechism, and were interested in arithmetics, all of whom were as exactly alike as their homes, and all of a piece with the monotony in which they lived. Paul never went up Cordelia Street without a shudder of loathing. His home was next to the house of the Cumberland minister. He approached it to-night with a nerveless sense of defeat, the hopeless feeling of sinking back forever into ugliness and commonness that he always had when he came home. The moment he turned at Cordelia Street, he felt the waters close above his head. After each of these orgies of living, he experienced all the physical depression which follows the debauch, the loathing of respectable beds, of common food, of a house penetrated by kitchen odours, a shuddering repulsion for the flavourless, colourless mass of everyday existence, a morbid desire for cool things and soft lights and fresh flowers. The nearer he approached the house, the more absolutely unequal Paul felt to the sight of it all, his ugly sleeping chamber, the cold bathroom with a grimy zinc tub, the cracked mirror, the dripping spigots, his father at the top of the stairs, his hairy legs sticking up from his nightshirt, his feet thrust into carpet slippers. He was so much later than usual that there would certainly be inquiries and reproaches. Paul stopped short before the door. He felt that he could not be accosted by his father to-night, that he could not toss again on that miserable bed. He would not go in. He would tell his father that he had no car fare, and it was raining so hard he had gone home with one of the boys and stayed all night. Meanwhile, he was wet and cold. He went around to the back of the house and tried one of the basement windows, found it open, raised it cautiously, and scrambled down the cellar wall to the floor. There he stood, holding his breath, terrified by the noise he had made, but the floor above him was silent, and there was no creak on the stairs. He found a soap-box and carried it over to the soft ring of light that streamed from the furnace door, and sat down. He was horribly afraid of rats, so he did not try to sleep, but sat looking distrustfully at the dark, still terrified lest he might have awakened his father. In such reactions, after one of the experiences which made days and nights of the dreary blanks of the calendar, when his senses were deadened, Paul's head was always singularly clear. Suppose his father had heard him getting in the window and come down and shot him for a burglar. Then again, suppose his father had come down, pistol in hand, and he had cried out in time to save himself, and his father had been horrified to think how nearly he killed him. Then again, suppose a day should come when his father would remember that night, and wish there had been no warning cry to stay his hand. With this last supposition, Paul entertained himself until daybreak. The following Sunday was fine. The sodden November chill was broken by the last flash of autumnal summer. In the morning, Paul had to go to church and Sabbath school, as always. On the seasonable Sunday afternoons, the burghers of Cordelia Street always sat down on the front stoops and talked to their neighbours on the next stoop, or called to those across the street in neighbourly fashion. 
The men usually sat on gay cushions placed upon the steps that led down to the sidewalk, while the women, in their Sunday waists, sat in rockers on the cramped porches, pretending to be greatly at their ease. The children played in the streets. There were so many of them that the place resembled the recreation grounds of a kindergarten. The men on the steps, all in their shirt sleeves, their vests unbuttoned, sat with their legs well apart, their stomachs comfortably protruding, and talked of the prices of things, or told anecdotes of the sagacity of their various chiefs and overlords. They occasionally looked over the multitude of squabbling children, listened affectionately to their high-pitched nasal voices, smiling to see their own proclivities reproduced in their offspring, and interspersed their legends of the Iron Kings with remarks about their sons' progress at school, their grades in arithmetic, and the amounts they had saved in their toy banks. On this last Sunday of November, Paul sat all the afternoon on the lowest step of his stoop, staring into the street, while his sisters, in their rockers, were talking to the minister's daughters next door about how many shirtwaists they had made in the last week, and how many waffles someone had eaten at the last church supper. When the weather was warm, and his father was in a particularly jovial frame of mind, the girls made lemonade, which was always brought out in a red glass pitcher, ornamented with forget-me-nots and blue enamel. This the girls thought very fine, and the neighbors always joked about the suspicious color of the pitcher. Today Paul's father sat on the top step, talking to a young man who shifted a restless baby from knee to knee. He happened to be the young man who was daily held up to Paul as a model, and after whom it was his father's dearest hope that he would pattern. This young man was of a ruddy complexion, with a compressed red mouth, and faded, near-sighted eyes, over which he wore thick spectacles, with gold bows that curved about his ears. He was clerk to one of the magnates of a great steel corporation, and was looked upon in Cordelia Street as a young man with a future. There was a story that, some five years ago, he was now barely twenty-six, he had been a trifle dissipated, but in order to curb his appetites and save the loss of time and strength that a sowing of wild oats might have entailed, he had taken his chief's advice, off reiterated to his employees, and at twenty-one had married the first woman he could persuade to share his fortunes. She happened to be an angular schoolmistress, much older than he, who also wore thick glasses, and who now had borne him four children, all near-sighted like herself. The young man was relating how his chief, now cruising in the Mediterranean, kept in touch with all the details of the business, arranging his office hours on his yacht just as though he were at home, and knocking off work enough to keep two stenographers busy. His father told, in turn, the plan his corporation was considering, of putting in an electric railway plant in Cairo. Paul snapped his teeth. He had an awful apprehension that they might spoil it all before he got there. Yet he rather liked to hear these legends of the Iron Kings that were told and retold on Sundays and holidays. These stories of palaces in Venice, yachts in the Mediterranean, and high play at Monte Carlo appealed to his fancy, and he was interested in the triumphs of these cash boys who had become famous, though he had no mind for the cash boy stage. After supper was over he needed help to dry the dishes. Paul nervously asked his father whether he could go to George's to get some help in his geometry, and still more nervously asked for car fare. This latter request he had to repeat, as his father, on principle, did not like to hear requests for money, whether much or little. He asked Paul whether he could not go to some boy who lived nearer, and told him that he ought not to leave his schoolwork until Sunday, but he gave him the dime. He was not a poor man, but he had a worthy ambition to come up in the world. His only reason for allowing Paul to usher was that he thought a boy ought to be earning a little. Paul bounded upstairs, scrubbed the greasy odor of the dishwater from his hands with the ill-smelling soap he hated, and then shook over his fingers a few drops of violet water from a bottle he kept hidden in his drawer. He left the house with the geometry conspicuously under his arm, and the moment he got out of Cordelia Street and boarded a downtown car, he shook off the lethargy of two deadening days and began to live again. The leading juvenile of the permanent stock company which played at the one of the downtown theatres was an acquaintance of Paul's, and the boy had been invited to drop in at the Sunday night rehearsals whenever he could. For more than a year, Paul had spent every available moment loitering about Charlie Edwards' dressing room. He had won a place among Edwards's following not only because the young actor, who could not afford to employ a dresser, often found him useful, but because he recognized in Paul something akin to what churchmen term vocation. It was at the theatre and at Carnegie Hall that Paul really lived. The rest was but a sleep and a forgetting. This was Paul's fairy tale, and it had for him all the allurement of a secret love. The moment he inhaled the gassy, painty, dusty odour behind the scenes, he breathed like a prisoner set free, and felt within him the possibility of doing or saying splendid, brilliant, poetic things. The moment the cracked orchestra beat out the overture from Martha, or jerked at the serenade from Rigoletto, 
all stupid and ugly things slid from him, and his senses were deliciously yet delicately fired. Perhaps it was because, in Paul's world, the natural nearly always wore the same guise of ugliness, that a certain element of artificiality seemed to him necessary in beauty. Perhaps it was because his experience of life elsewhere was so full of Sabbath school picnics, petty economies, wholesome advice as to how to succeed in life, and the inescapable odors of cooking, that he found this existence so alluring, these smartly clad men and women so attractive, that he was so moved by these starry apple orchards that bloomed perennially under the limelight. It would be difficult to put it strongly enough how convincingly the stage entrance of that theatre was for Paul the actual portal of romance. Certainly none of the company ever suspected it, least of all Charlie Edwards. It was very like the old stories that used to float about London of fabulously rich Jews, who had subterranean halls there with palms and fountains, and soft lights and richly apparelled women who never saw the disenchanting light of London day. So, in the midst of this smoke-palled city, enamoured of figures and grimy toil, Paul had his secret temple, his wishing carpet, his bit of blue and white Mediterranean shore bathed in perpetual sunshine. Several of Paul's teachers had a theory that his imagination had been perverted by garish fiction, but the truth was that he scarcely ever read at all. The books at home were not such as would either tempt or corrupt a youthful mind, and as for reading the novels that some of his friends urged upon him, well, he got what he wanted much more quickly from music, any sort of music, from an orchestra to a barrel organ. He only needed the spark, the indescribable thrill that made his imagination master of his senses, and he could make plots and pictures enough of his own. It was equally true that he was not stage-struck, not, at any rate, in the usual acceptation of that expression. He had no desire to become an actor any more than he had to become a musician. He felt no necessity to do any of these things. What he wanted was to see, to be in the atmosphere, float in the way of it, to be carried out, blue league after blue league, away from everything. After a night behind the scenes, Paul found the schoolroom more than ever repulsive. The bare floors and naked walls, the prosy men who never wore frock coats, or violets in their buttonholes, the women with their dull gowns, shrill voices, and pitiful seriousness about prepositions that govern the dative. He could not bear to have other people think for a moment that he took these people seriously. He must convey to them that he considered it all trivial, and was there only by way of a jest, anyway. He had autographed pictures of all the members of the stock company which he showed his classmates, telling them the most incredible stories of his familiarity with these people, of his acquaintance with the soloists who came to Carnegie Hall, his suppers with them, and the flowers he sent them. When these stories lost their effect, and his audience grew listless, he became desperate and would bid all the boys good-bye, announcing that he was going to travel for a while, going to Naples, to Venice, to Egypt. Then, next Monday, he would slip back, conscious and nervously smiling. His sister was ill, and he should have to defer his voyage until spring. Matters went steadily worse with Paul at school, and the itch to let his instructors know how heartily he despised them in their homilies, and how thoroughly he was appreciated elsewhere. He mentioned once or twice that he had no time to fool with theorems, adding, with a twitch of the eyebrows and a touch of that nervous bravado which so perplexed them, that he was helping the people down at the stock company. They were old friends of his. The upshot of the matter was that the principal went to Paul's father, and Paul was taken out of school and put to work. The manager at Carnegie Hall was told to get another usher in his stead. The doorkeeper of the theatre was warned not to admit him to the house, and Charlie Edwards remorsefully promised the boy's father not to see him again. The members of the stock company were vastly amused when some of Paul's stories reached them, especially the women. They were hard-working women, some of them supporting indigent husbands or brothers, and they laughed rather bitterly at having stirred the boy to such fervid and florid inventions. They agreed with the faculty, with his father, that Paul's was a bad case. The eastbound train was ploughing through a January snowstorm. The dull down was beginning to show grey when the engine whistled a mile out of Newark. Paul started up from the seat where he had lain curled in uneasy slumber, rubbed the breath-misted window glass with his hand, and peered out. The snow was swirling in curling eddies above the white bottomlands, and the drifts lay already deep in the fields and along the fences while here and there the long dead grass and dried weed stalks protruded black above it. Light shone from the scattered houses, and a gang of labourers who stood beside the track waved their lanterns. Paul had slept very little, and he felt grimy and uncomfortable. 
He had made the all-night journey in a day coach, partly because he was ashamed, dressed as he was, to go into a Pullman, and partly because he was afraid of being seen there by some Pittsburgh businessman who might have noticed him in Denny and Carson's office. When the whistle awoke him, he clutched quickly at his breast pocket, glancing about him with an uncertain smile. But the little clay-bespattered Italians were still sleeping. The slatternly women across the aisle were in open-mouthed oblivion, and even the crummy, crying babies were for the nonce stilled. Paul settled back to struggle with his impatience as best he could. When he arrived at Jersey City Station, he hurried through his breakfast, manifestly ill at ease and keeping a sharp eye about him. After he reached the 23rd Street Station, he consulted a cabman and had himself driven to the men's furnishing establishment that was just opening for the day. He spent upward of two hours there, buying with endless reconsidering and great care. His new street suit he put on in the fitting room, the frock coat and dress clothes he had bundled into the cab with his linen. Then he drove to a hatter's and a shoe house. His next errand was at Tiffany's, where he selected his silver and a new scarf pin. He would not wait to have a silver marked, he said. Lastly, he stopped at a trunk shop on Broadway and had his purchases packed into various travelling bags. It was a little after one o'clock when he drove up to the Waldorf, and after settling with the cabman, went into the office. He registered from Washington, said his mother and father had been abroad, and that he had come down to await the arrival of their steamer. He told his story plausibly and in no trouble, since he had volunteered to pay for them in advance in engaging his rooms, a sleeping room, a sitting room, and a bath. Not once, but a hundred times, Paul had planned his entry into New York. He had gone over every detail of it with Charlie Edwards, and in his scrapbook at home there were pages of description about New York hotels cut from the Sunday papers. When he was shown to his sitting room on the eighth floor, he saw at a glance that everything was as it should be. There was but one detail in his mental picture that the place did not realize, so he rang for the bellboy and sent him down for flowers. He moved about nervously until the boy returned, putting away his new linen and fingering it delightedly as it did so. When the flowers came, he put them hastily into water, and then tumbled into a hot bath. Presently he came out of his white bathroom, resplendent in his new silk underwear, and playing with the tassels of his red robe. The snow was whirling so fiercely outside his windows that he could scarcely see across the street, but within the air was deliciously soft and fragrant. He put the violets and jonquils on the tabaret beside the couch, and threw himself down with a long sigh, covering himself with a Roman blanket. He was thoroughly tired, and he had been in such haste, he had stood up to such a strain, covered so much ground in the last twenty-four hours, that he wanted to think how it all come about. Lulled by the sound of the wind, the warm air, and the cool fragrance of the flowers, he sank into deep, drowsy retrospection. It had been wonderfully simple. When they had shut him out of the theatre and concert hall, when they had taken away his bone, the whole thing was virtually determined. The rest was a mere matter of opportunity. The only thing that at all surprised him was his own courage, for he realized well enough that he had always been tormented by fear, a sort of apprehensive dread that of late years, as the meshes of the lies he had told closed about him, had been pulling the muscles of his body tighter and tighter. Until now, he could not remember the time when he had not been dreading something. Even when he was a little boy it was always there, behind him or before or on either side. There had always been the shadow corner, the dark place into which he dared not look but from which something seemed always to be watching him, and Paul had done things that were not pretty to watch, he knew. But now he had a curious sense of relief, as though he had at last thrown down the gauntlet to the thing in the corner. Yet it was but a day since he had been sulking in the traces, but yesterday afternoon that he had been sent to the bank with Denny and Carson's deposit as usual, but this time he was instructed to leave the book to be balanced. There was above two thousand dollars in checks, and nearly a thousand in the bank notes which he had taken from the book and quietly transferred to his pocket. At the bank he had made out a new deposit slip. His nerves had been steady enough to permit of his returning to the office, where he had finished his work and asked for a full day's holiday tomorrow, Saturday, giving a perfectly reasonable pretext. The bank book, he knew, would not be returned before Monday or Tuesday, and his father would be out of town for the next week. From the time he slipped the bank notes into his pocket until he boarded the train for New York, he had not known a moment's hesitation. This was not the first time Paul had steered through treacherous waters. How astonishingly easy it had all been! Here he was, the thing done, and this time there would be no awakening, no figure at the top of the stairs. He watched the snowflakes whirling by his window until he fell asleep. When he awoke, it was three o'clock in the afternoon. He bounded up with a start, half of one of his precious days gone already.' 
He spent more than an hour in dressing, watching every stage of his toilet carefully in the mirror. Everything was quite perfect. He was exactly the kind of boy he had always wanted to be. When he went downstairs, Paul took a carriage and drove up Fifth Avenue toward the park. The snow had somewhat abated. Carriages and tradesmen's wagons were hurrying soundlessly to and fro in the winter twilight. Boys in woolen mufflers were shoveling off the doorsteps. The avenue stages made fine spots of colour against the white street. Here and there in the corners were stands, with the whole flower gardens blooming under glass cases against the sides of which the snowflakes stuck and melted. Violets, roses, carnations, lilies of the valley, somehow vastly more lovely and alluring that they blossomed thus unnaturally in the snow. The park itself was a wonderful stage winter piece. When he returned, the pause of the twilight had ceased, and the tune of the streets had changed. The snow was falling faster, light streamed from the hotels that reared their dozen stories fearlessly up into the storm, defying the raging Atlantic winds. A long black stream of carriages poured down the avenue, intersecting here and there by other streams, tending horizontally. There were a score of cabs about the entrance of his hotel, and his driver had to wait. Boys in livery were running in and out of the awning stretched across the sidewalk, up and down the red velvet carpet laid from the door to the street. Above, about, within it, all was the rumble and roar, the hurry and toss of thousands of human beings as hot for pleasure as himself, and on every side of him towered the glaring affirmation of the omnipotence of wealth. The boy set his teeth and drew his shoulders together in a spasm of realization. The plot of all dramas, the text of all romances, the nerve stuff of all sensations was whirling about him like snowflakes. He burnt like a faggot in the tempest. When Paul went down to dinner, the music of the orchestra came floating up the elevator shaft to greet him. His head whirled as he stepped into the thronged corridor, and he sank back into the one of the chairs against the wall to get his breath. The lights, the chatter, the perfumes, the bewildering medley of colour. He had, for a moment, the feeling of not being able to stand it. But only for a moment. These were his own people, he told himself. He went slowly about the corridors, through the writing rooms, smoking rooms, reception rooms, as though he were exploring the chambers of an enchanted palace, built and peopled for him alone. When he reached the dining room, he sat down at a table near the window. The flowers, the white linen, the many-coloured wine glasses, the gay toilettes of the women, the low popping of the corks, the undulating repetitions of the blue Danube from the orchestra, all flooded Paul's dream with bewildering radiance. When the roseate tinge of his champagne was added, that cold, precious, bubbling stuff that creamed and foamed in his glass, Paul wondered that there were honest men in the world at all. This was what all the world was fighting for, he reflected. This was what the struggle was about. He doubted the reality of his past. Had he ever known a place called Cordelia Street, a place where fagged-looking businessmen got on the early car, mere rivets in a machine they seemed to Paul, sickening men, with combings of children's hair always hanging to their coats, and the smell of cooking in their clothes. Cordelia Street. Ah, oh, that belonged to another time and country. Had he not always been thus? Had he not sat here night after night, from as far back as he could remember, looking pensively over just such shimmering textures, and slowly twirling the stem of a glass like this one between his thumb and middle finger? He rather thought that he had. He was not in the least abashed or lonely. He had no especial desire to meet or to know any of these people. All he demanded was the right to look on and conjecture, to watch the pageant. The mere stage properties were all he contended for. Nor was he lonely later in the evening, in his lodge at the Metropolitan. He was now entirely rid of his nervous misgivings, of his forced aggressiveness, of the imperative desire to show himself different from his surroundings. He felt now that his surroundings explained him. Nobody questioned the purple. He had only to wear it passively. He had only to glance down at his attire to reassure himself that here it would be impossible for anyone to humiliate him. He found it hard to leave his beautiful sitting-room to go to bed that night, and sat long watching the raging storm from his turret window. When he went to sleep, it was with the lights turned on in his bedroom, partly because of his old timidity, and partly so that, if he should awake in the night, there would be no wretched moment of doubt, no horrible suspicion of yellow wallpaper or of Washington and Calvin above his bed. Sunday morning, and the city was practically snowbound. Paul breakfasted late, and in the afternoon he fell in with a wild San Francisco boy, a freshman at Yale, who said he had run down for a little flyer over Sunday. The young man offered to show Paul the night side of the town, and the two boys went out together after dinner, 
not returning to the hotel until seven o'clock the next morning. They had started out in the confiding warmth of a champagne friendship, but their parting in the elevator was singularly cool. The freshman pulled himself together to make his train, and Paul went to bed. He awoke at two o'clock in the afternoon, very thirsty and dizzy, and rang for ice water, coffee, and the Pittsburgh papers. On the part of the hotel management, Paul excited no suspicion. There was this to be said for him, that he wore his spoils with dignity, and in no way made himself conspicuous. Even under the glow of his wine he was never boisterous, though he found the stuff like a magician's wand for wonder-building. His chief greediness lay in his ears and his eyes, and his excesses were not offensive ones. His dearest pleasures were in the grey winter twilights in his sitting-room, his quiet enjoyment of his flowers, his clothes, his wide divan, his cigarette, his sense of power. He could not remember a time when he had felt so at peace with himself. The mere release from the necessity of petty lying, lying every day and every day, restored his self-respect. He had never lied for pleasure, even at school, but to be noticed and admired, to assert his difference from other Cordelia Street boys, and he felt a good deal more manly, more honest even, now that he had no need for boastful pretensions, now that he could, as his actor friends used to say, dress the part. It was characteristic that remorse did not occur to him. His golden days went by without a shadow, and he made each as perfect as he could. On the eighth day after his arrival in New York, he found the whole affair exploited in the Pittsburgh papers, exploited with a wealth of detail which indicated that local news of a sensational nature was at low ebb. The firm of Denny and Carson announced that the boy's father had refunded the full amount of the theft, and they had no intention of prosecuting. The Cumberland minister had been interviewed, and expressed his hope of yet reclaiming the motherless lad, and his Sabbath school teacher declared that she would spare no effort to that end. The rumour had reached Pittsburgh that the boy had been seen in a New York hotel, and his father had gone east to find him and bring him home. Paul had just come in to dress for dinner. He sank into a chair, weak to the knees, and clasped his head in his hands. It was to be worse than jail, even. The tepid waters of Cordelia Street were to close over him finally and forever. The grey monotony stretched before him in helpless, unrelieved years. Sabbath school, young people's meetings, the yellow-papered room, the damp dish-towels. It all rushed back upon him with a sickening vividness. He had the old feeling that the orchestra had suddenly stopped, the sinking sensation that the play was over. The sweat broke out on his face, and he sprang to his feet, looked about him with his white, conscious smile, and winked at himself in the mirror. With something of the old childish belief in miracles with which he had so often gone to class, with all his lessons unlearned, Paul dressed and dashed whistling down the corridor to the elevator. He had no sooner entered the dining-room and caught the measure of the music than his remembrance was lighted by his old elastic power of claiming the moment, mounting with it, and finding it all sufficient. The glare and glitter about him, the mere scenic accessories, had again, for the last time, their old potency. He would show himself that he was game. He would finish the thing splendidly. He doubted, more than ever, the existence of Cordelia Street, and for the first time he drank his wine recklessly. Was he not, after all, one of those fortunate beings born to the purple? Was he not still himself and in his own place? He drummed a nervous accompaniment to the Pagliacci music and looked about him, telling himself over and over that it had paid. He reflected drowsily, to the swell of the music and the chill sweetness of his wine, he might have done it more wisely. He might have caught an outbound steamer and been well out of their clutches before now. But the other side of the world had seemed too far away and too uncertain then. He could not have waited for it. His need had been too sharp. If he had to choose over again, he would do the same thing tomorrow. He looked affectionately about the dining room, now gilded with a soft mist. Ah, it had paid indeed. Paul was awakened next morning by a painful throbbing in his head and feet. He had thrown himself across the bed without undressing, and had slept with his shoes on. His limbs and hands were already heavy, and his tongue and throat were parched and burnt. There came upon him one of those fateful attacks of clear-headedness that never occurred except when he was physically exhausted and his nerves hung loose. He lay still, closed his eyes, and let the tide of things wash over him. His father was in New York stopping at some joint or other, he told himself. The memory of successive summers on the front stoop fell upon him like a weight of black water. He'd not a hundred dollars left, and he knew now, more than ever, that money was everything, the wall that stood between all he loathed and all he wanted. The thing was winding itself up, 
he had thought that on his first glorious day in New York, and had even provided a way to snap the thread. It lay on his dressing table now. He had got it out last night when he came blindly up from dinner. But the shiny metal hurt his eyes, and he disliked the looks of it. He rose and moved about with a painful effort, succumbing now and again to attacks of nausea. It was the old depression exaggerated. All the world had become Cordelia Street. Yet somehow he was not afraid of anything, was absolutely calm, perhaps because he had looked into that dark corner at last and knew. It was bad enough, what he saw there, but somehow not so bad as his long fear of it had been. He saw everything clearly now. He had a feeling that he had made the best of it, that he had lived the sort of life he was meant to live, and for half an hour he sat staring at the revolver. But he told himself that was not the way, so he went downstairs and took a cab to the ferry. When Paul arrived in Newark, he got off the train and took another cab, directing the driver to follow the Pennsylvania tracks out of town. The snow lay heavy on the roadways, and had drifted deep in the open fields. Only here and there the dead grass or dried weed stalks projected, singularly black, above it. Once well into the country, Paul dismissed the carriage and walked, floundering along the tracks, his mind a medley of irrelevant things. He seemed to hold in his brain an actual picture of everything he had seen that morning. He remembered every feature of both his drivers, of the toothless old woman from whom he had bought the red flowers in his coat, the agent from whom he had got his ticket, and all of his fellow passengers in the ferry. His mind, unable to cope with vital matters at hand, worked feverishly and deftly at sorting and grouping these images. They made for him a part of the ugliness of the world, of the ache in his head, of the bitter burning on his tongue. He stooped and put a handful of snow into his mouth as he walked, when he reached a little hillside, where the tracks ran through a cut some twenty feet below him, he stopped and sat down. The carnations in his coat were drooping with the cold, he noticed, the red glory all over. It occurred to him that all the flowers he had seen in the glass cases that first night must have gone the same way, long before this. It was only one splendid breath they had, in spite of their brave mockery at the winter outside the glass and it was a losing game in the end, it seemed, this revolt against the homilies by which the world is run. Paul took one of the blossoms carefully from his coat, and scooped a little hole in the snow where he covered it up. Then he dozed a while from his weak condition, seeming insensible to the cold. The sound of an approaching train awoke him, and he started to his feet, remembering only his resolution, and afraid lest he should be too late. He stood watching the approaching locomotive, his teeth chattering, his lips drawn away from them in a frightened smile. Once or twice he glanced nervously sidewise as though he were being watched. When the right moment came, he jumped. As he fell, the folly of his haste occurred to him with merciless clearness, the vastness of what he had left undone. There flashed through his brain, clearer than ever before, the blue of the Adriatic water, the yellow of Algerian sands. He felt something strike his chest and that his body was being thrown swiftly through the air, on and on, immeasurably far and fast, while his limbs were gently relaxed. Then, because the picture-making mechanism was crushed, the disturbing visions flashed into black, and Paul dropped back into the immense design of things. End of Paul's Case by Willa Cather